There's a lady named Raven. I would tell you her last name, but it's like three words together, and I'm sure I'm going to just destroy it, so I'm not. Um, but she is from Virginia, up in the mountain area of, of Virginia. She has a piece of land there, and she owns some sheep. <laughs> so she is literally um, a shepherd in today's modern world. <laughs> so she's a shepherd, and she, she loves it. She's always wanted to. I mean, she ended up buying these sheep just out. I mean, she's always wanted to have sheep. I mean, for, it's just been her, her thought. I mean, uh, you think, hey, I want a few dogs or a cat or something like that. Nope, she's wanted to farm with sheep. And um, one day, somebody was selling sheep, and she says, I want them all. And so she bought them. So that's how that came about. And um, it, everything's good until something goes bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, there's always that chance something's going to go bad. And she has a sheep named Lindy. And Lindy was pregnant, and um, she's been down for four days with this pregnancy. Um, it, based from her phone calls to other shepherds in the area, um, it's too long for her to be down that um, she's not going to survive this pregnancy. And um, that was what everybody was telling. Lindy um, nibbled at the hay that um, Raven was handing out to her. She just kind of nibbled at it, and then um, she just weakly laid her head down, just too weak to even eat the straw. Um, she wasn't getting up. The worst part is, I think it was February, it was cold. Um, she's a three-year-old you that um, just laid there and unable to give birth to an obviously huge <laughs> baby. And um, she, you know, at some point, Raven was thinking, well, maybe it's twins. I mean, maybe that's what it, but it, just the signs and talking to others that um, had these, it's, it's just something's going massively wrong. The only large animal veterinarian in the area, small town, right, um, was out of town. The on-call vet advised her, just watch her. That's it. <laughs> just watch her. And then the sarcasm kicks in because Raven's like, what does he think I was doing? I've been watching her for days, paying attention to her, trying to figure this out. Every two hours, around the clock, I'd sat with Lindy, coaxing her to eat and drink. Nothing had changed. Desperate, I'd message other shepherds online. She's, bound, she's been down too long to survive. Here, the one thing that I'm going to just tell you is Dr. Google, um, never a good thing whenever you have people that are sick. Um, uh, I know it sounds good, but there's Dr. Google just um, does And then in messaging people, uh, sometimes it's good, but in the long run, um, People that are giving you their opinions and don't know all the facts um, may just bring you down and at a time you don't need it. Not that they're doing it on purpose. It's just people don't always have good news. And obviously all of these people were agreeing that this was not good. So not that she didn't need to hear it, but it's like, was it dependable or not? It was 11 p.m., uh, pitch black. Anybody ever know? What's pitch black? A, a, a tar, a pitch, tar, all right? I'm learning, I, I've heard it all my life. I'm from Alabama. It's a, just never had, this is the first time. Yes, it's that dark, yes, right, right there, yep, yep. Um, a tar, and what were you saying back there? What was it? Uh, it's a. Well, like, would they um, coated Noah's Ark? With coated pitch. with pitch, yes. So it's, so it's, in the Bible. So it, it, it's, a term, yeah, it's a biblical term, yeah, and I, I've seen, I just, a pitch, yeah. black, well, but tar, yeah. All right. Hey, I can't be the only person that wanted to know that. I can't be. Or I could be, and then that's really bad that I had to ask on, well, live. Yeah. Good old Noah's Ark, right? And go back to that for answers. Um, every, uh, let's see. Where was I at now? Um, yeah, it was 11 p.m., pitch black, except for my headlamp. The Virginia mountain air froze my every breath. 
Lindy's belly was so distended, she looked like a giant wad of wool with a head stuck on it as an afterthought. Each time I came to the shelter, I moved her legs, trying to keep her um, circulation going. I massaged her thighs, working my hands into her, her thick wool. She says, I pray, help me, God. She says, that's not the first time I prayed. I'm always praying. All these days, I'm constantly praying. Then she prays, please let Lydie and her, li- her lambs live. And then there's this. Isn't that, doesn't that just seem like a moment that God could just, like, you know, you read the Bible and you hear, like, um, a a prophet or somebody, they pray, and then all of a sudden something happens, or, you know, you see a, a burning bush moment. This is a burning bush moment. This is the time. You're like, please, God, let Lindy and her lambs live. And then she says, all I heard was the wind blowing against the canvas of the shelter. Yeah. That's more realistic, though. I mean, I want that um, burning bush moment, that, 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 those signs of God really doing something like, wow, you heard my prayer. And then there's just that dead silence. That's really the way it is. Um, there are those moments. But more than anything, there's those dead silent moments or you just hear the wind blowing. And there, I believe there's a reason for that. I believe that... If, if every time we prayed, we heard or saw a miraculous sign right away, we wouldn't have to depend on God for anything to happen later. It would just be like, hey, God, you didn't do it, so I guess we're done. <laughs> no, he, he's like, okay, I heard your prayer. Now trust me. Just trust me. I don't need to do a sign. There's times when Jesus was telling um, the people, he's like, all you're looking for is a sign. You got to trust me. I mean, and how many times did he tell these people this? You're all here because of the food. He actually mentioned that. I love that. You're all here for the food, and you're looking for signs. And so this is not an uncommon thing, but get used to it because it's a way to teach us just trust God. Pray and know he heard your prayer. Go back to Daniel. When Daniel was praying and the angel came, um, what was it, 21 days later, And said, God heard your your prayer from the first day. He's been praying for 21 days, obviously, because they named it. And he's praying for a specific thing. And it took 21 days. And then this angel shows up and says, God's heard you from the very first time. And this is all the things that's been taking place. And then the angel tells him about all the things, like details about what's been happening so that God could answer his prayer. Then you're like, oh, wow, you've been doing all that? I mean, all these different events that's taking place. And um, it just makes you realize that God's doing so many things. And, and he doesn't need to give us the summary or the, the checkup to say, oh, hey, this is what happened today. This is how it's going. He, he doesn't need to do that. We just sit back and say, God, I'll let you know what's going on. I'm leaving it in your hands. And at the right time, you know what? I know you'll answer me. Now, that, I'm saying that like, oh, yeah, it's easy to say from up here. But... I've been through these things, and I know I totally stress out, and I totally yell at God. I am that person. God, I I prayed about this. Why aren't you answering me? And then, I mean, I don't know how many times I physically, mentally, whatever it's called, inside that inside voice, I literally hear God say, are you done yet? You done whining? You done complaining? I mean, seriously. And it's almost like, yeah, I got you. <sighs> Raven says, my other ewes have given birth to three lambs without any assistance from me. The way sheep have done for thousands of years. <laughs> it's just like, hey, this has been pretty easy raising these sheep. But by the end of January, Lindy's belly was huge and getting bigger. One day I found her in the field, unable to stand. I tried co- coaxing her with um, sweet molasses. She looked away. Finally, I grabbed her by the hindquarters, pulled her partially to her feet, and led her to the shelter where I'd been checking on her ever since. When I wasn't with Lindy, I was scoring the internet, watching videos, reading articles, and poring over forums and posts and trying to figure out um, um, what's 
out there? What kind of resources could I find? But there's nothing, nothing about what to do with an expectant mother that's too swollen to move. And everything online was about these births that just go smoothly, what she's already experienced with her others. Lindy said that, I mean, not Lindy said, Raven said, it'd be good. <laughs> if Lindy starts speaking, we're really, <laughs> there's a miracle. Uh, Raven said that Lindy um, started having that glass, glassy look, that glassy-eyed look. I mean, I think that's just when um, you just know the person's going to die, or the, in this case, the animal's going to die. They just get that stare. Um, that's, I, I think that's when, when you're working with somebody and they get that look. Um, I think that's when you start realizing the reality of what's about to take place. And I know that that's what happened to Raven. Um, but as always, as a, as a shepherd, as a leader, as a, a mom, or as a caregiver, she scratched her jawline. She murmured appreciatively, it's going to be okay. As much for me as for Lindy, she said I had to say it. We're going through this together. She kissed her goodnight and went inside because she goes, I got to get some sleep. As much as Lindy's going through all of this, she's been taking on this 24-7, just taking care of her, and she's just worn out. It's interesting. Because shepherds, I mean, we don't understand shepherds here around this area. I mean, there's obviously where she's at and others. I mean, I didn't even know that you could go online and find a group of shepherds chatting. <laughs> it's just not common here. Even though when we go on trips, though, we go through areas that there's, oh my goodness, there's farms full of them, right? But it is a biblical thing, and Jesus uses it. The scripture uses it a lot. And it's in John 10, is the one I'm going to talk about today, John 10, 25 through 30. There's much more before that, and Jesus really goes into this um, the shepherd and um, who the sheep are and who, who knows the voice of the shepherd and and who the thieves are. But in John 10, 25 through 30, it says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. There's something to this sheep thing. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus is referring to the people that believe in him and follow him. He's referring to sheep to them because these people, they do know sheep. They know what the shepherds are like. They know what it's like to take sheep and lead them and have to take care of them, provide them water, provide them food. Um, it, you, the protection that the shepherds have to do, he's using this because they can understand it, but it's great for us to know too. Look at how Jesus is saying, I'm going to protect the ones who follow me. Guess what? It also says that you will know his voice. There's a lot of people that say they're Christians and they have never, ever, ever heard from God. And like I said, they say they're Christians. If you're walking and talking reading the scripture, you're praying to God, he's answering you, you learn to hear his voice. And I'm not talking like a voice out here that you can hear audibly. Um, I know a lot of people want to hear that. It's a voice inside. It guides and directs you, and you will know it because of this. Because you continually read the scripture, pray to him, and stay in communication and watch him work in your life. What does that mean? That means you're living out what you say you believe. You're not just a person that says you're a Christian. I'm a Christian, but you never read the Bible. You never pray. You never are obedient to the scripture. Are you, one of the, you know, the too many people tell me that they're Christians, and I see them living a life that is totally against God. 
the thing that Jesus died on the cross for, the sin, they're out there doing. How can you be a follower of Jesus and live the life that he died on the cross to save you from? It doesn't make sense. If Jesus hates sin so much that he's willing to sacrifice his life to save you from it, why would we be in a relationship with him and continue to live in that life? So whenever we think about this relationship with Jesus, he's saying, follow me. And that's what he said. They hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Guess what that means? If you're following Jesus, you're being obedient to Jesus. Obedient? See, a lot of people tell me I repented of my sins. That's wonderful. That's a good thing because repenting is a bigger word than asking for forgiveness. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. That's good. That is polite. That is not repenting. Repenting is I'm sorry and I'll never do it again. I'm turning away from whatever I've done. I'm turning away. And it's actually a term that means I'm turning away from something. Um, It's a military term, but just with anything. I may be doing all these things and listening to this, but I'm going to turn to something else. And what the Bible's telling us is you're going to stop listening to the world and the way that Satan has built this messed up kingdom that he wants and you're going to turn away from all of that and you're going to turn to Jesus Christ and the way that his kingdom is. You're going to turn to him for guidance, for direction, for um, love, for for relationship. You're all dependent. It's like your whole life. You're saying, God, I've been going the wrong way. I've been listening to all these people, all these ideas. But your scripture says all those things are sinful. And if I'm going to follow you, then I must repent. It means turn away from. I'm going to turn away from. What are you turning away from? Sin. What are you turning to? Jesus. That's what that means. If, so whenever people say they're, they're sorry for their sins, or they're, they're, that's great. I mean, that, that's, a good, that's a good place to be. But the true definition for salvation is is that you repent, which means turn away from, and then you begin to follow. So you turn away from sin, you begin to follow Jesus. That's salvation. It's not any work that you did. You just chose to be obedient to Christ. So as a shepherd, Jesus is continually taking us as sheep and leading us, and we follow him, and we hear his voice. I mean, man, uh, my dad... Years ago, it, um, my dad was a meter reader for the power company in Alabama, and um, he would come home. And I remember, I know Tim's online now. Tim, there's probably what ten years difference between us as kids, and um, I remember pictures of him with my dad had squirrels um, that he had just brought home, and then years later, here I am, and. Me and my younger brother, um, my dad brings some squirrels home. Who can go out there and just bring a squirrel home? I mean, he goes to work, goes and reads meters, and then comes home, and we have a squirrel. And so my dad would take him, um, feed him, maybe for a week, and then let him go. But every time he feeds him, he talks to him, he whistles he, um, it, it becomes, in that short amount of time, that squirrel learns to trust him. And then every day, from then on, every day, my dad would come home from work, 4.30 in the afternoon. He would go outside. He would whistle. And you would, in Alabama, there's trees everywhere, um, unlike here. And you don't even have to see the squirrel. You would just see the leaves, uh, the, the limbs and the leaves moving and falling, but the limbs would just be bouncing from tree to tree to tree to tree all around the, the yard. And then finally, that squirrel comes down that tree right up to my dad. That squirrel knows his whistle, he knows the sound of his voice. It didn't take a long time. And I'm like, so how did you catch the squirrel? 
because I was out reading meters, and um, my dad would wear, um, I mean, it's cold in Alabama, but my dad wouldn't wear fancy stuff. He, he, he would go to the Navy, Army Navy surplus store and bought those big military army jackets, and, which had the big pockets. And he said, I would just get down and um, throw some peanuts. And um, he goes, I don't know. It was so cold, the squirrel jumps in my pocket. <laughs> he goes, so I brought it home. <laughs> The squirrel was whisper, I guess. I don't know. But it was just that, that in that amount of time, that squirrel responded to that where every day it would just whistle and the, that squirrel would come just flying down. No fear whatsoever. I have tried that all my life. I have never, ever gotten a squirrel to come to me. But Jesus is telling us that you as sheep, you as followers... This is, this is the connection. He's going to lead you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to guide you the right way. But you must listen for his voice. And he says, my sheep, my believers, my followers know my voice. And don't, and don't take this bad like, oh, I've never heard from God. I guess I'm not. No, it takes, it takes actually a relationship and process of actually reading the scripture, not to just say it because, oh, hey, my pastor told me I need to read the Bible three times this week. No, as a relationship, God talked to me today. How does God gonna, how is he gonna talk to you? Mainly through the word. Now, I told you about that voice you hear inside. It's usually scripture that is re, being revealed again that you've read already, but God speaks to us, and when he speaks to us, you can hear it. You just know that's God. But it takes a process. It takes that relationship building. It takes, Ben, I don't know, I mean, whenever you first start in a relationship and you start dating, um, the very first time you start dating somebody, um, you don't know much about them, but you know you like them. For whatever attraction it is. It's their personality, it's their looks, um, it's their fancy car, whatever reason that attracted you to them, right? Um, yeah. You get the car. It was the car, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So whatever that is, but that you build from that. It was that first connection. Then you start dating and you start realizing, hey, we've been talking a lot, getting to know each other, starting to find out, hey, we both like Alabama football. Hey, there's somebody out there. That's it. <laughs> but whatever the reasons, but you start learning this stuff, and then eventually you get married. You want to know something? You still don't know everything about the person. I mean, it's crazy. As soon as you get married, it's like a whole new person. You're like, what? I never knew this about you. Yeah, It's just crazy stuff. I mean, because what? Now you're living in the same house. And, 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 and you're starting to make decisions together about your bank accounts, about um, if you want to own a house or rent a house. And I mean, all of a sudden you're making these decisions. Have kids or not have kids. And then, who's the stay-home person? <laughs> Is it the dad or the mom? Who's staying home? Who's taking care of the kids? I mean, these are all decisions that you're like, oh, well, we never talked about that. <laughs> or you're both going to work, and then, wait a minute, who's going to babysit our kids all day? And then, are we sending them to public school? Uh, or <laughs> So, anyway. You see what I mean? It's a constant thing. And the same way, thing with God. Jesus is our shepherd, and we're constantly seeing that we can trust him. Every time he puts out food for us and blesses us and takes care of us, every single thing he does, we're learning, oh, wow. Why is he taking us out of this area here, and he's taking us over there? Oh, wait a minute. Look, there's more grass over there for us to eat. <laughs> there's more food. So he takes you from one place to another. And it's just one of those things whenever you read John um, 10, 25 through 30, it's just like he's saying that. He says, what's the ultimate goal? You're going to follow him and believe in him and trust in him here because he's got something really good planned for you as a believer and only for people as believers. Nobody else gets this. No one else will get to experience the thing that he's promising you. And you need to really understand this because it's totally worth giving everything you have for this one thing that he says. And he says, and I give eternal life to them. Not to everybody. Now think about that. 
because I am one person that probably does not deserve eternal life. (laughs) But he's saying, if I'll just be obedient to him and turn my life to him and trust him, he loves me enough to take care of me here, guide me and direct me here, make sure that all the life's troubles, the struggles and everything that Satan's trying to mess up this, in my life in this world, he's saying, I, I'm going to take care of you here. I'm going to give you guidance and direction here. But there's a day where I'm giving you eternal life and you don't even have to worry about this mess down here anymore. And just in case we didn't understand it, he didn't say just, he says, and those and they that follow me, I give them eternal life. And if you didn't understand that, he said, and they will never perish. In case you didn't understand that eternal life meant you will never perish. You'll never die. And I, I know it's one of those things that people always say it. They go, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's such a lie because people die all the time. No, you need to just read the Bible more. Your flesh drops to the ground. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your soul, your spirit instantly is with the Father. And you know what Jesus says about that? He says, I have prepared a place for you. What? A place for what? For your soul, your spirit. He's prepared a place. In fact, he says you're going to receive a glorified body. A glorified body is one that will never, ever get sick again. You will never, ever have to wear a mask because of COVID or any other thing. Isn't that going to be good? You'll never have to decide between one vaccine or not a vaccine. Boy. The decisions that we will not have to make are going to be good. Isaiah 40 says, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. This is, this is a prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Kind of fits the story, doesn't it? When I tell you that you hear God's voice, this is, I'm going to just give you an example of what happened to us. And I, I probably told you this probably 10,000 times before, but it, it just never gets old in my life. I um, hope it doesn't get old to you. But Tina and I, when we were struggling with ministry uh, financially um, for our own personal lives and financially because of the exclaimed events that we were doing and all the resources that we were having to use up, there was so many times that um, we went totally broke. And, um, and, and, and it was like that time, like what Raven was saying here, she prayed and then all she heard was the wind blowing against the shed or whatever, the shelter. And that's how it was with us. Um, I had, I, I just had that faith in God and there's so many things that happen in that walk with God in that beginning. And that's that walk with God is what really built my relationship with God because he did not answer right away every time. He made me wait. He allowed me to go through things to show that, as in the Veggie Tale song, he is bigger than the boogeyman. He is bigger than Godzilla, right? I mean, I needed to come face to face with Godzilla to see that God can handle that. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, I, that's where I get most of my theology is Veggie Tales, but uh, it's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, hey, man, I like it. <laughs> Others do too. All right, we're all together. Um, but there was this one day that um, I was down. I was beaten up. I was down. Um, we couldn't financially afford what God had called me to do, which was do this big event. And it, obviously, th- th- this happened several times. I, it's not like one day I said, oh, we don't have enough money. There was the roller coaster ride. There was days that I thought, okay, God's got this thing. We're all in. And then there was those bottoms where I just landed, and I'm like, if one more problem happens, um, we're not going to make it. And then the problem would happen. I'm like, ugh. So there was that day, and um, I just prayed and prayed about these things. And um, God hit me with like three Bible verses in different books of the Bible right in, in, in sequence. The reason I tell you that is because 
if you don't believe that God speaks through the Bible, um, I'm sorry, you are just totally missing out. Because, um, boy, when, those, when his words jump off that page and into your life at the time that it's needed, uh, there's no other, there, it's, there's no luck to it. But um, when it's from one book of the Bible and then the next book of the Bible or a different page, and those pages, you, you know there's, there's 66 books, right? 66. Six, six. Um, there's 66 books in the Bible, and are, you know so we call them letters, books, whatever, but it, to make up the whole Bible. And then you have that, and for, for thousands of years it was written. So for you to look into the Bible and read, and you're going through something, and you read in one place where it answers it, and then you happen to move over to something else, and it answers it, and then you happen to go somewhere else, and it answers it. What's the chances in that Bible, written over thousands of years by um, many, many different people? Well, it's because God, God knows every word on the page. And when you're going through something, he goes, hey, go to, go to um, this book, chapter something, we'll page this, or whatever. I mean, but no, he just directs you there. So this is one of those times. I had just read... Um, previous to this, something um, else that I was, I was praying to God about. And he just answered it. I, and I flipped over the page. And, I, and, and, and I'll just tell you about this one, not the other one, because just too many conversations here. But I just prayed and said, God, you called me to do this. Me and my family, we've given up everything to do this thing. But now we're done. It's over. And instead of telling me, hey, are you done whining? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's Isaiah 66, 7 through 9. He says, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Before the pain, she gave the birth. Before the pain, before all the stuff happened, she gave birth. Who has heard of such a thing? That's not the way it works is what he's saying. That's not it. You don't get the end result without going through the process. And he says this. He says, who has heard of such a thing? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery? I'm going to go through ups and downs, hard times, good times, bad times, but I told you to go out and do what I told you to do. Now go do it and just know I'm not going to take you to the point and just drop the ball. Why would I take you to the time of birth and not deliver? And that's how close we were to doing this event that we were supposed to be doing. And we were right there, and then it just all fell apart. I was like, no. I'm not going to do that to you. I told you to do it. Now, I, 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 I will just tell you that whenever I read that, it wasn't like just reading it like what I'm telling you right now. There was a moment of just humbling. I just, I wept. I thank God I did everything. It was like those were the words that I need to hear. It was like I um, I just, he could have said anything else in the world and it wouldn't have made any sense to me. This right there was the answer. And it gave me hope. And let me tell you something, because it's not just words on the page. It's the living word of God. It's living. It's like when you need it to speak, it speaks. And it spoke. And I heard it. And that you can read that same verse right now and it will mean nothing to you maybe. Because God didn't speak it to you at the time that it was ready. <laughs> it's live and it's ready to be used at the time that he's going to use it and he's going to present it. And, then, and, and, and it's a disappointment. Let me tell you what. Because I'll go up and I'll tell somebody. I'll say, man, and this is the Bible verse that he gave me? And, and they're like, yeah, it's in there. Because why? It wasn't a conversation between them. 
It was a conversation with me and God, and it totally had meaning. It totally had purpose. It was at the exact moment that I was praying, and that was the answer. I'm not taking you to that point and then just going to bail out on you. That's all I needed to hear. Because if I got God, I got everything. Raven says, I woke up with a start at 4 a.m. after being so tired. She goes, I overslept. <laughs> I'm like, what? Sounds like Trevor. <laughs> hey, you're in the sermon twice today. That's, you know. I threw on some clothes and a farm coat and ran to the shelter. Lindy was still lying on her side. But her water had broken. A four-inch tail was wiggling out of her, and at last I knew. Veterinarians here? At last she knew. (laughs) I point to our veterinarians just to say, you know how this is going to end probably already. The baby was breech. Now I knew what was going on. I scrambled back to the house, grabbing rubber gloves, vegetable oil, a basket of sheep shearing tools, and an armful of towels. By the, by the time that I got back to Lindy, the lamb inside of her was desperately trying to get out, thrusting hard against Lindy's belly. Oh, you poor baby, I cried. I pushed the little tail back into Lindy, reached inside, and tried to um, reach for her head. What I felt was a bunch of other stuff. Just leave it at that. She goes, just stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. She goes, everything she felt, she could not find the baby's head. And she's like, I just can't, I can't. And then, and then all of a sudden, I reposition myself and push my arm. Still no head. Instead, I felt some medical term that I don't know what it means. But it means there's a second lamb. And I broke the membrane. Fluid gushed out. I carefully pulled the lamb into the world by its head in two tiny front hooves. I gazed at this little black nose and I touched its white muzzle. I felt it take its first breath. Those beautiful dark eyes looked up at me. And I was smitten. I dried off the lamb and I set it in front of Lindy, but she barely lifted her head. She was losing energy fast. I pulled off my gloves, put on another pair, oiled up my hands again to deliver the breech lamb. How long had it already been? I should have asked you two about this, but this is what she says. That after the water breaks, the chances of survival really slim down after about an hour. She goes, I was racing against the clock. Lindy's belly was strangely still. I searched and searched for the breech lamb's face and her front hooves. I couldn't find it. The only thing I could do was deliver it with the back legs. I waited for a contraction, pulled swiftly, and it came out, but the lamb wasn't breathing, fighting back tears. I shook it gently, then harder, held it upside down, cleared its mouth, wiped it off, compressed the chest, and nothing. The first lamb was standing and stumbling toward me as I held the twin. God, Please don't give up on this little lamb, I shouted, rubbing its chest. The little lamb took a deep breath and wiggled in my grasp. Oh, thank you, Jesus, I said, as my fear and my doubts melted away. I was overwhelmed with joy. I'd never been left alone. You understand that? God was with her through it all. She's been freaking out for four days or more, and then all these things are taking place. She's freaking out, but God never left her. 
God was there directing everything that was happening. She didn't understand that there was two in there. She didn't understand that one was breach. She didn't understand how this was all going to come together. And she definitely didn't know that that lamb was going to take that deep breath. The great shepherd had been right there with me and Lindy as well as her lambs. And with his help, I could handle my job, my son's expenses, and this farm and care of all the animals who called it home. She was saying, because of this, I now know that I can take care. She's a single mom. She could take care of her animals. She could take care of her son. She could take care of her home because she has God. This is the experience. And I tell people all the time, it, you, need, um, you need to have an encounter with God. You need a lifetime, at least once, encounter with God where you think you've lost it all. And then you let God shine. And that's the day you will always go back to when anything happens. And it's, as, it's true throughout the scripture because throughout Egypt and all the things that took place, remember they always say, but he got you through the, through the water. He got you through the desert. He provided the food. Because we go back to that and we're like, okay, God did that. He's not going to let us down now. I took off my gloves, replaced them with a new pair. Used the last one to oil up the, um, I wanted to get out all the afterbirth because I knew that Lindy couldn't do all that right now. She's way too weak. The twins nuzzled at each other as I felt inside once again, but there was something else, a third face and another set of hooves. No wonder Lindsay had been so down. She's now having a third little lamb, and it's really rare that yous have triplets. I quickly broke the third lamb's water and pulled it out. I cleaned off its face and rubbed it dry, and it, it blinked at me as if to say, thank you for not forgetting me. So this is something that she understood a little bit too well. That God's not going to forget you. It may not be your time at the time that you think it's time, but God's, he's your shepherd. It doesn't mean that you won't go through troubles and trials. I mean, Lindy was worn out delivering triplets. Something that's rare, but she did it. Raven, who never experienced any of this, and of course the veterinarian's going to be out of town, and of course the information she's getting not going to be related, because God's not looking for them to be the heroes. God's looking for you to see him, to see his power and his abilities. Not that we don't need others to come in our life, but there's a time that God will take every resource you have away to just say, hey, you can't give anybody else credit but me because I want you to see me. And once you see Jesus, you don't need anything else. The rest is just fluff. <laughs> She says, I am reminded of God's loving presence every day now as I walk out in the pasture and see Lindy and her three healthy lambs gazing next to me. When they catch sight of me, they all come running with Lindy in the lead. Verse 